Hey everybody, it is Thursday, March 28th. You're listening to the Mo News Podcast. I'm Mo Wanunu. How are you, Jill? And I'm good. I'm Jill Wagner. This is the place where we bring you just the facts. And we read all the news and read between the lines so you do not have to. So Mosh, on Tuesday night, I emceed an event here on Long Island. It's recognizing the best of Long Island, all sorts of different categories, restaurants, doctors, etc. And what I learned is that Mo News has officially made it to Long Island because I met uh, at least one very big fan of our podcast. And I was introducing her because she was one of the sponsors of the event. And she said she listens to us every morning. So Jenna, if you are listening, good morning and good morning to everybody else out there. Really appreciate the support. As I said to her and I say on this podcast every once in a while, anyone who is taking any time out of their day uh, to spend with us, we really appreciate it. So thank you. Looking to get big on Long Island, Jill. I need you out there marketing, putting <laughs> pamphlets. And do people still put like uh, pamphlets in uh, on windshields in parking lots? Got to get out there, (laughs) spread the word, grassroots. That is not a bad idea because a lot of people listen to podcasts in the car. There we go. So uh, you're you're reaching people where they are. This is why I need some more swag. I'll be a walking billboard. Mo.news slash merch for all of you looking for swag. (laughs) All right, let's get to some headlines. The investigation into the Baltimore bridge collapse picks up speed. What we know about the victims and what could have caused the crash. And we'll talk about the cost of rebuilding here, which could stretch into the billions of dollars. And we'll tell you about the law from the 1800s that was last used by the Titanic owner to try to get out of liability and why it might come in clutch for the owner of the ship in this case. Nuclear energy is all the rage. We'll tell you why the Biden administration wants to reopen a plant in Michigan. A settlement in the legal battle between Disney and Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. And we remember former senator and Democratic vice presidential nominee Joe Lieberman, who died yesterday at the age of 82. The Utah women's basketball team says it experienced racist abuse while on the road for the NCAA tournament. We'll tell you what happened. South Carolina has one point eight billion dollars, but somehow does not know where that money came from. (laughs) We'll explain the accounting mess inside South Carolina. Not a terrible problem to have, right? Not exactly, Jill, but it does come as there were billions of dollars of needs unmet in the state, and they're sort of wondering, wait, we had this money? Plus, Moshe is on this day in history, or on this week in history, as he accidentally did the wrong day. Yeah, I accidentally did the wrong day, but I promise you the majority of on this day actually happened (laughs) on March 28th. Way to call me out, Jill, on the podcast. No, the majority of it did actually happen March 28th. I may have thought today was March 29th, so I might have prepared some stuff for March 29th, but because we don't do on this day on Fridays, anyway, you'll get some interesting stuff. Okay, so let's start with the latest on the Baltimore Bridge tragedy. On Wednesday, authorities continued their search for the bodies of construction workers who were on the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore when it was struck by a cargo ship and collapsed into the Patapsco River. Divers recovered the bodies of two of the workers on Wednesday. Officials say the men were found inside of a red pickup truck that tumbled into 25 feet of water. The men were believed to have been taking a break from work and sitting in their truck when the bridge collapsed. They are still looking for the other four men. And the weather on Wednesday really not helping with a lot of rain and thick fog in the area. That bridge was the second longest continuous truss bridge span in the world. The cargo vessel, the Dolly, lost power early Tuesday before colliding with a support column of the bridge. The missing workers had been presumed dead based on the temperature of the water in the upper 40s and just the amount of time that they had been missing. The six missing workers included men from Mexico, Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras. They were working for Browner Builders, a bridge maintenance contracting firm. Another employee for that company had said that the men had all come to the city in hope of giving their families and their home countries better lives. The men were all in their 30s and 40s. Many of them married and had kids, including 49-year-old Miguel Luna. And Mosh, also on Wednesday, we heard Maryland Transportation Authority police dispatch audio that was captured right before the collapse. And you could hear the officers trying to block traffic. And they were about to warn the workers. Here's some of it. We can stop traffic. Just make sure no one's on the bridge right now. Uh, I'm not sure where. uh, There's a crew up there. You might want to notify whoever the foreman is. See if we can get them off the bridge temporarily. 10-4. Once the other unit gets here, I'll ride up on the bridge. I have 
All interloop traffic stopped at this time. Once you get here, I'll go grab the uh, workers on the key bridge and then stop the outer loop. C-13 dispatch, the whole bridge just fell down. Start, start is whoever, everybody. The whole bridge just collapsed. As for the 22 crew members of the Dolly, they are still on the ship. Yeah, they're going bit by bit here in the investigation. They have recovered the black box from the ship, which can provide clues into what went wrong. They'll use that to piece data together and put together the timeline here as to what happened. There have been various leaks about the ship and previous inspections uh, and concerns about the ship going back a couple of years here. So we're still awaiting some more details here. One port worker telling media that the Dolly was experiencing a, quote, severe electrical problem. It uh, struck the bridge but days before it was uh, allowed to leave on its way to Sri Lanka. Now, U.S. government authorities from President Biden on down to Transportation Secretary, Secretary, Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg say uh, the U.S. government will immediately get started here on uh, cleaning this up and rebuilding the bridge. But it will not be quick. It will not be easy and it will not be cheap. Now, uh, for those of you asking, and I certainly got a few questions on the Instagram account, the government will pay for this because it'll be much quicker that way. Now, they are planning on collecting money back from the insurance company and from the uh, company that operated the ship here. But that's going to be a long legal mess, a lot of proceedings, and they do not want to wait very long for what is a very vital bridge uh, for the Port of Baltimore and for the entire eastern seaboard. So they're going to avoid the red tape by basically paying for it up front. It's something similar to what the U.S. government did uh, almost 20 years ago now when that Minneapolis bridge collapse happened, if you remember that. Now, that was just a sudden collapse of the bridge, nothing crashing into the bridge. In this case, you can point the finger on the cargo container ship. As for how much they're going to have to pay here, experts who look at this sort of thing say it has the potential to run upwards of one and a half billion dollars to be paid out here by the shipping company. Various experts said somewhere between a billion, billion and a half. And as I noted, it's going to take a while here for that payout to happen, for the insurance companies, for potential litigation here uh, in the courts. At the same time, there appears to be a law still on the books in the U.S. from the year 1851 that could lower the amount of financial exposure for the shipping company. In fact, while I mentioned one and a half billion dollars or so, this could lower exposure to less than a hundred million dollars. Because that's because this law from 1851, which was passed back in the day to lower liability for cargo container ships, uh, still is operational. And one company that famously used this law to lower li- their liability, Jill, the company that operated the Titanic more than 100 years ago, they faced a whole bunch of lawsuits and they used this law from 1851. So uh, we'll see if this uh, comes in here uh, relevant uh, to this scenario. As far as the rebuilding, the predictions are they could take at least five years to build a new bridge here. That's how long the original bridge took to be rebuilt. Uh, we'll see if they're able to speed it up in any way, shape or form. In the meantime, they are uh, hoping to reopen the port soon, which first means they got to disentangle the uh, boat from the existing uh, bridge. Uh, some say that could take at least six weeks uh, to uh, open that up. And as we told you yesterday, the Port of Baltimore, very, very busy, it is the bu- busiest carport uh, in America, deals with a lot of uh, foreign equipment coming in. And those are cars, vehicles, construction equipment that are distributed across the country. Also, the fuel from the ship did not leak into the water either, at least not yet. Divers in the water are making sure that the ship isn't taking on water. Now, one of the issues that has come up in terms of infrastructure is that ships are getting bigger and bigger and infrastructure like these bridges not built with that in mind. The Baltimore Bridge was built in the 1970s. The Dolly is longer than three football fields and ships that size have only been around for a couple of decades. Now to the latest indication that the U.S. and other developed countries are turning back to nuclear power as a solution to curb CO2 emissions and climate change. The U.S. government announced yesterday that it will give a Michigan nuclear power plant that is currently shut down a one point five billion dollar loan to restart operations If everything goes according to plan, it will be the first restarted nuclear power plant in American history. It could start operating in late 2025. The project aims to bring back the Palisades nuclear plant. It stopped operations in May of 2022 because of financial troubles. The current owner had planned to dismantle it, but Michigan lawmakers and the Biden administration had other ideas. 
More nuclear is in line with the Biden administration's ambitious climate agenda, which includes plans to decarbonize the electric grid by 2035. Nuclear is thought to be a central component to being able to meet that goal. Energy Secretary Jennifer Granholm, who is also the former governor of Michigan, says nuclear power is our single largest source of carbon-free electricity, directly supporting 100,000 jobs across the country and hundreds of thousands more indirectly. Nuclear power is seeing a renaissance of sorts in recent years, Jill, because one of the key things that everyone is focused on is eliminating anything that puts greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere. And as the country that pollutes the most per capita in the world, China pollutes the most overall, we pollute the most per uh, our population, given that our population is about a quarter of that of China, uh, we are trying to find uh, other ways to decarbonize here. So that includes uh, taking, so that includes, uh, according to advocates, so that includes going back to nuclear power. Uh, advocates have been making this case for a while here. But for a number of years, there was a lot of skepticism. There were cost issues. There's a question of how to bury radioactive waste. And then you had the Chernobyl incident, uh, the Three Mile incident, which, by the way, uh, today is the uh, anniversary of the Fukushima nuclear meltdown uh, just over a decade ago. So people were pushing away from it. Now they're returning to it. The issue with nuclear energy, it costs a lot of money to produce. It is more expensive than fossil fuels, more expensive than solar, more expensive than wind. And that has led to a dozen reactors that have shut down in the U.S. over the course of the past decade. And then, the, and then, of course, there's the idea of building new nuclear power plants, but that is extremely expensive. Uh, we recently told you about the plant uh, that was opened up in Georgia over the summer. That cost about $35 billion with a B, was seven years late, and $17 billion over budget. So the U.S. government had to get uh, involved in that and put money towards that to, to try to incentivize uh, that plant to come online. This project is anticipated to avoid about 5 million tons of CO2 emissions a year. It'll help power nearly a million homes uh, in that part of the country. It's still going to take some time here for this loan deal. Uh, They're going to have to undergo inspections. Remember, they shut down this plant. They're going to take it apart. So now they're ready to revive this. Uh, But it is sorely needed. And here in the U.S., just to give you some perspective, we are 5% of the world's population, but we consume 16% of the world's energy. And with that in mind, uh, we joined 33 other countries last week and pledging to use nuclear power to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels. Yeah, as of 2022, the U.S. had under 100 nuclear power reactors that collectively generated about 18 percent of all U.S. electricity. Time for the speed read from The Washington Post. The board appointed by Governor Ron DeSantis to oversee Disney's former special taxing district agreed Wednesday to a settlement with the entertainment giant, capping a legal feud over who should control development at the sprawling theme park complex. The Central Florida Tourism Oversight District, made up of DeSantis appointees, agreed to drop its lawsuit against the company in exchange for Disney relinquishing some control over its 25,000 acre property. Disney will also drop a lawsuit of its own over public records from the district. Both sides on Wednesday made statements indicating they're ready to move on from the political battle that started in 2022 when Disney's former CEO criticized the DeSantis-backed parental rights law that critics dubbed Don't Say Gay. Disney is still appealing a separate federal lawsuit. But the back and forth between Disney and DeSantis is not entirely over here. There was a federal lawsuit that was dismissed earlier this year. Uh, That lawsuit filed by Disney against DeSantis alleged that he had violated their First Amendment rights. So Disney is still pursuing that case here. But the future of that case hinges on, quote, pending negotiations between the company uh, and the district over new development. So you can imagine they might want to settle this out of court. But this is just the latest turn here in what has been nearly a three-year saga between uh, one of the largest employers in Florida and the governor. If you remember at the time, uh, DeSantis passed this parental rights bill, uh, again, what the critics called the Don't Say Gay bill. Disney came out in opposition to the legislation. Employees uh, at the company uh, were upset by the fact that this prohibited instruction of gender identity and sexual orientation uh, in K through three. Disney was going to initially stay out of this. Employees pushed executives there to get involved. That didn't make DeSantis very happy. So then he started pushing back on them. And uh, the story went on. 
for the last three years here. So there have been a few settlements here. Uh, there's also been a clarification in the law internally in Florida, which helped clear things up for teachers who were very worried that they literally couldn't discuss, you know, if they happen to be a gay teacher, uh, that they have a, a wife or a husband uh, of the same gender at home. And that has now been cleared up to say, no, you can do that. This has to do with instruction. You know, it's something we talk about all the time, Jill, with some of these laws that are passed so quickly through state legislatures that are written in a very vague way that create a lot of fear uh, and don't deal with a lot of specific scenarios. The bottom line, the back and forth wasn't great for either side, really, for Disney or for DeSantis. So I think both are probably happy to put it behind them, at least for <laughs> move the on from part. this, though. It did help DeSantis with his national profile for a bit, but then it sort of pigeonholed him as this culture warrior, which, of course, uh, didn't ultimately help him that much on the campaign trail when he tried to run for president. Well, Nikki Haley slammed him on it and was like, all right, Disney, come to South Carolina. We're ready for it. You You want to create jobs and do all that? Great. Come here. And and Trump the same way. Trump Trump and Nikki Haley said, we're the the, uh, party of free enterprise. We're the party that helps corporations. We're not the party that regulates. So why are we picking fights with big companies? From Politico, Joe Lieberman, the former Connecticut senator and Democratic vice presidential nominee in 2000, has died. He was 82 years old. His family said in a statement that he died because of complications from a fall. In a statement, they said Senator Lieberman's love of God, his family and America endured throughout his life of service in the public interest. His wife, Hadassah, and other family members were at his side when he died, according to their statement. And Lieberman was still extremely active in politics. In fact, he was leading an effort to recruit a candidate for the group No Labels, which has been seeking a unity ticket to run independently of the Democratic and Republican parties. Mosh, in fact, we mentioned him on the podcast, I think, last week. Yeah, it was the first Lieberman mention on this podcast in a year and a half, in fact. Uh, and by the way, who, which politician in their 80s is not actively involved still, Jill? Uh, Joe Lieberman was one of them. He's only a year older than Joe Biden and five and four years older than Donald Trump, by the way. Uh, a little background here. Halfway through his Senate career, he served in the Senate for about 24 years, Lieberman was chosen as Al Gore's running mate for the 2000 presidential election. Now, let's go back to that era. Al Gore was coming off of being vice president for Bill Clinton. The whole questions about morality uh, and ethics coming out of the Lewinsky scandal were hot. So Al Gore chose somebody who sort of is the opposite of Bill Clinton uh, in certain ways in a uh, Orthodox Jew named Joe Lieberman uh, on the ticket. And... Uh, Actually, they won the popular vote in 2000. Uh, They just lost the electoral vote because of a couple hundred votes in Florida. So Lieberman became that close uh, to being a vice president, uh, the the farthest a Jew has ever gone in national politics, uh, we should note. Uh, Then Joe Lieberman, after losing in 2000, tried to come back and run for president himself in 2004, trying to become the Democratic nominee. He ran in that race, if you remember, 20 years ago. Uh, John Edwards, John Kerry, Wesley Clark. Uh, John Kerry would ultimately become the nominee. Uh, Funny enough, uh, Jill, I was a a, a young staffer at Fox News at the time. I remember watching the uh, Joe Lieberman rallies, and he was trying to make the term Joe Mentum happen. He's like, do you feel the Joe Mentum? Unfortunately for him, not enough people felt the Joe Mentum. Now, Where he did accomplish much more was over in the U.S. Senate. Uh, He was big in the Foreign Affairs Committee. He was one of the uh, legislative godfathers, if you will, post 9-11 in creating the Department of Homeland Security and creating that committee uh, for the Senate. And he was very close to John McCain and Lindsey Graham, uh, a couple of Republican colleagues there. While he was liberal on a number of social issues, he was much more conservative on foreign policy, huge proponent of the 2003 invasion into Iraq. Uh, that in, that really doomed him with the party. In fact, uh, he almost lost a Senate seat, would have to run as an independent in Connecticut. And then just a few years later, Jill, I'm a producer on the John McCain campaign for Fox News covering the McCain campaign. And uh In the summer, as he's trying to figure out who his VP nominee is going to be, he tells his advisors, McCain does, I want Joe Lieberman, the Democratic VP nominee from 2000, to be my Republican VP nominee in 2008. His advisors at the time uh, include Steve Schmidt, Nicole Wallace, who have both become much more liberal in recent years, say – Uh, John, you're crazy because he's pro-choice and the Republican Party is going to rip you to shreds. They test out that message, including to a couple of reporters, including this here reporter. Uh, They see the backlash they get from Republicans across the country. 
And so McCain is annoyed and he's like, fine, if I can't have Joe, you guys figure out who my VP is going to be. And they come back to him a week later with, we should try this governor from Alaska named Sarah Palin. There's something about that, Moshe, though, that brings me back to just a different time in American politics where where both sides of the aisle were talking to each other. There was there was at least a group of senators who were bipartisan and worked together. John McCain being one of them, Joe Lieberman, Lindsey Graham back then. Anyway, he was seen as somebody who did reach across the aisle. And we just don't really have that anymore. Right. Like it's remarkable that we were this close, this close to having the same individual be a VP nominee on a Democratic ticket and then eight years later on a Republican ticket. Uh, And can you imagine today like Mike Pence being Biden's VP or, you know, like Nate or or Kamala Harris running on the GOP ticket? Like that's where politics uh, have gotten. Now, listen, Lieberman did have his detractors and there is certainly no shortage of Democrats who were really concerned and annoyed about the no labels movement and the fact that they they see that as a way to take votes away from Democrats. But Lieberman was earnest in this, right? So you have Lieberman, Joe Manchin, uh, John Huntsman on the Republican side, uh, a number of those individuals who are sort of old school, who are like, we used to talk to each other. Can we find an alternative that is down the middle? But at least for now, that they don't appear to be close on that at all. And according to the polls, Americans want that. No one really is interested in Joe Biden versus Donald Trump, and they are looking for politicians to come together. Yeah, and that's what Joe Lier- that's what Joe Lieberman was saying as recently as last week. All right, from CNN, police in a northern Idaho town are investigating alleged incidents of racial hate crimes after the University of Utah's women's basketball coach said her team was targeted while in town for the NCAA tournament last week. This all happened in the town of Coeur d'Alene. According to a statement from Utah athletics officials, the team was on its way to dinner when a vehicle drove past and shouted racial epithets at the group. And then later, when the team was on its way back from dinner, a vehicle drove slowly past the group, revving its engine, while the occupants again shouted racially disparaging words and threats. Members of the Utah women's basketball team say that they have been left deeply troubled and shaken by what team officials called hateful and disturbing racial abuse ahead of their NCAA tournament opening game. The deputy athletic director saying that the N-word had been shouted at the team on each of the two occasions. The team has filed a police report. They say it happened last Thursday ahead of a game against South Dakota State in Spokane, Washington, which is about 30 miles away. That area of Idaho has been described as a safe haven for white supremacist groups. Yeah, there have been a lot of incidents there, Jill, though the white supremacist groups were uh, interviewed in a local newspaper saying this totally didn't happen. So the police are trying to get to the bottom of all of this. Uh, In the meantime, the uh, team felt so concerned for their own safety, they ended up moving uh, to a different hotel closer to Spokane because of the fact that they just didn't feel safe after this. It was initially reported that there were approximately 100 people who were in the vicinity of the incident when it occurred. Police are working with the FBI uh, on this case. And we should note that uh, Utah ended up going on to win against South Dakota State uh, in their game, but then lost to Gonzaga in the next round later in the tournament. From Bloomberg, drivers in New York City inched closer to paying a new fee to enter Manhattan's central business district after the MTA approved the nation's first congestion pricing plan. It could start as soon as mid-June. The board of the MTA, which is implementing the toll, authorized the pricing structure in an 11 to 1 vote during its monthly meeting on Wednesday. Most that one vote that wasn't in favor from Nassau County, where I live, the head of the MTA (laughs) saying... (laughs) Way to take a stand, Nassau County. (laughs) The head of the MTA saying, New York has more traffic than any other place in the United States, and now we are doing something about it. The new plan will charge most cars $15 for entering the borough south of 60th Street during peak times. So just to give you a sense, New Yorkers know what we're talking about. If you're not as familiar with the city, effectively... All of Lower Manhattan, so basically everything under Central Park, Times Square, uh, Broadway area, uh, Soho, down through downtown, down by the World Trade Center, etc. That's the area we're talking about here. Uh, and this has been hugely controversial, Jill. There is not one. There is not two. There are not three, but there are five legal cases right now. So they're hoping to implement this, as you mentioned, by mid-June. But between all the legal cases, probably not happening 
that soon. Uh, now, what they are hoping to do is reduce traffic, improve air quality, boost transit ridership, provide an estimated $1 billion to modernize the subways. If you've taken the New York City subways, or you've seen the pictures. It's like a third world country down there. In fact, uh, there are many parts of the world, uh, less developed world, that have better subway systems than we have here in New York City. So, uh, so New York is trying to figure out ways to continue to uh, boost revenue, especially as office space remains empty uh, and the world has never quite come back to what it was uh, pre-COVID. As far as numbers here, we're talking about a $15 toll between 5 a.m. and 9 p.m. on weekdays, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. on weekends. It's then $24 for small trucks, $36 for large trucks, uh, just about $8 for motorcycles. Now, there will be a, a cheaper price overnight, but pretty significant here, Jill, and also uh, taxis, Ubers, Lyfts will all uh, now have new fees associated with this as well. So we'll see what happens legally here. But, you know, New York trying to do this. And you do see this around the world, cities like Amsterdam, uh, Paris, uh, London, uh, a number of cities uh, in Asia as well that are trying to find ways to cut down on the number of uh, vehicles, car traffic there, both for environmental reasons, but also uh, – but also – but also just lifestyle reasons, as we mentioned, just cleaner air with less cars, uh, with less cars uh, sitting in traffic all day in the middle part of the city. So obviously I am biased because I live on Long Island. And, so and you would not I like to pay more money yes. to come into Manhattan. Yes. But the flip side of this is that, number one, the train, a.k.a. mass transportation, not cheap at all. Uh, so the tickets on the LIRR, I think, are pretty expensive, actually. And as they look to get more people back into the office, this seems to be a deterrent. That is what critics say. Plus, adding the fee on top of trucks, all of that is going to get passed on to consumers because the trucks are ultimately carrying goods. Those goods are going to then get more expensive. So that is the argument against. Again, I admit I'm coming from this as, as a pretty biased right. we're, perspective. We're clear with our biases here at Mo News. Jill is admitting she is very biased in this story uh, in one way. But, Jill, that is why we at Mo News have put our headquarters in Brooklyn, not in Manhattan. So you are free to come to the office here in Brooklyn. No <laughs> this is the, yeah, I don't fee. have any excuse. <laughs> no excuses. All right, now time for On This Day in History. We begin in the year 1797. The washing machine was granted a patent in the U.S. The patent titled Clothes Washing was granted to Nathaniel Briggs of New Hampshire. Now, of course, this is a, a much older version than the uh, Whirlpool or Maytag you use today. Uh, Jill, it gives me an excuse to mention that coming up in just a couple of weeks, uh, we will be doing something in honor of National Laundry Day. Yes, that exists. Uh, we'll be bringing you a Q&A on the podcast, on the Instagram about everything you wanted to know, uh, answer all your questions about shrinking clothes, washing whites, washing colors, warm water, cold water, washing your athleisure. Uh, just get excited because it turns out that April 15th is not only tax day, but it's National Laundry Day. So stay tuned. I'm excited because I'm someone who washes my white clothes with all of my colored clothes. And what? And I feel like I know that's the reaction I get when I tell people that. But I. But it never bleeds over, so I think it's okay. Why? Because you're avoiding reds with the whites? Red's, red's a killer. Red is always messing with the whites. I guess I've never really had an issue. Anything that's white that's really, really important, I guess I just send to the dry cleaner. And so, Mosh, I live on the edge, Jill, and I it's, it's worth it to me. Jill, I don't think I've ever seen you wear white, and I think now I know the reason for that. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Maybe you don't own it I've anymore. ruined it all. I've either, I either either don't own it or... <laughs> All right, let's postpone this till our National Laundry Day conversation. Fast forward to 1881. Uh, on this day in history, P.T. Barnum and James Bailey, you recognize those last names? They merged their circuses, Barnum and Bailey, and they would become known, or at least they would dub themselves, the greatest show on earth. All right, a lot of nuclear-themed news today. As I mentioned, on this day in 1979, America's worst commercial nuclear accident occurred when a valve mistakenly closed uh, at early morning hours at Three Mile Island in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, culminating in some leakage. And we're going to stick with the 70s here for a second. Uh, in movie history, on this day 47 years ago, Rocky won Best Picture. This is the original uh, Rocky, won Best Picture at the Oscars. 
There would eventually be eight sequels, nine films total, including those uh, three recent Creed films. And one more item from the 70s as we head into the home stretch here, the music portion of Honest Day in History. Hey, sister ghost, sister soul, sister da, sister. Lady Marmalade by LaBelle reached number one on the Billboard charts, Jill, turning 49 years old today. And Mosh, I'm sure you won't be surprised that yours truly is a big fan of the, the remake of that song with Christina Aguilera, Little Kim, Maya, Pink, and Missy Elliott. Lady Marmalade, so good. Generations of divas singing that song. Speaking of divas, Jill, 32 years ago today, In Vogue comes out with their Funky Divas album. Uh, that, of course, was just my lovin', uh, which also gave us one of the uh, best 90s acapellas uh, in the song. Let's head to 308 into the song. What is it? What part? Now it's time for the breakdown. Never gonna get it, never gonna get, get, never it. Gonna get, never get it. Never gonna get it. Never okay. gonna get it, never <laughs> gonna get it. Jill, they don't make the songs that way anymore. We're like, no. they're just like, we're gonna take a break. We're now three minutes into the song, <laughs> and now we're gonna go. Now it's time for the breakdown. And they're just like, we're gonna just say the name of the song over and over again. But it works. It works. It did. I, now that you mentioned kind of what the breakdown of that song, uh, no pun yeah. intended, yeah. it's a little strange, but I loved it. Loved every it's, second. Listen, early 90s, they don't get enough credit for the things they were coming up with. The, the music uh, visionaries in Vogue. In Vogue, they gave us a few hits then uh, in the early 90s. All right, guys. Thank you for listening to the Mo News Podcast. If you like what you hear, please share this with your friends. It will help us grow. Follow us and subscribe so you don't miss an episode and review us in the App Store. And check out our uh, sister podcast, our cousin podcast, our brother podcast, whatever we're calling it these days, the Mo News, the interview podcast. And of course, uh, if you like what we're doing here on this podcast, on the newsletter, over on the Instagram account, and you want more or just want to support what we're doing, join Mo News Premium over at mo.news slash premium. It's a way to support what we're doing here, support our work, and also get access to Q&As, uh, deep dives, behind the scenes content, weekend content, uh, news quiz, and Jill is cooking up a special podcast quiz. Do you think you know this podcast well? Well, over on the premium Instagram account, you're going to get a special insiders quiz and see how well you know it. And it has been so much fun to put together. So I'm really excited about it. You, this is really going to test you to see how often you listen to this pod, this here pod. <laughs> we'll let you know, know when my, it's available. My biggest debate is how obscure I should go. Go you know, obscure, something Jill. only had one Bonus reference. Points. I don't know. Mm. Um, all right. <laughs> all right, everyone have a wonderful day. And of course, happy Friday Eve. Friday Eve. Friday Eve's our made-up <laughs> holiday. Today is actually uh, in real... In the real world, Holy Thursday. So wishing all of you a meaningful Holy Thursday uh, if you celebrate. And then we will see you tomorrow.